This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible, truly made possible, by our sponsors, Carrier, carrier Carrier.com. We are Carrier Dealers. I'm proud to be a Carrier Dealer, and there's a lot to like about Carrier. You can find out more by going to Carrier.com or talk to your local Carrier distributor. Ours is Carrier Enterprise. Also want to thank Field Peace for coming on board and supporting the podcast. I'm very thankful for their integration with MeasureQuick very wise decision that they made to work with MeasureQuick, and it really is a, a perfect marriage between their probes and the MeasureQuick app. If you haven't tried them together, I would suggest looking at their JL3 probes, but also their MR45 recovery machine and VP85 vacuum pumps. We use a ton of them at Kalos. They really are industry-leading products, very, very nice products. You're going to want to check those out. Find out more by going to fieldpeace.com. And then NAVAC, NAVACglobal.com. NAVAC makes lots of really high-quality products, recovery machines, vacuum pumps. They're coming out with a new line of hoses and some other products, but they also make a compact swedge tool that I actually am coming around to. When I first saw it, I didn't quite know how to use it, and I didn't get the results that I was hoping for. But once I learned how to use it, it really is a nice swedge tool to keep in the bag. My oldest son just got his first veto bag and i'm gonna give him one of those hand swedges to put in his veto bag nice tool and then also of course they have their battery powered flaring tool that you're going to want to check out you can find out all of it again navacglobal.com or by going to truetechtools.com t-r-u techtools.com if you find something you like you can use the offer code get schooled for a great discount and then finally refrigeration technology some of the nicest guys in the industry john and mike pastorello I built a great company out there in California with refrigeration technologies. They make great cleaners that do the job, but without any toxic odors and without the danger of harming technicians and customers. That's their Viper cleaners, especially the Viper spray can. If you haven't tried that for a coil cleaning in place, then I'm going to suggest that you give it a shot. It really is very nice. And then also, they're all their cleaners for cleaning condensers. Their pan and drain spray is excellent. Check it all out by going to refrigetech.com or by going to truetechtools.com. You can find it all there as well. Seriously, his initials are B O for a reason. Brian Orr. Yo, bruh. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the HVAC School podcast the podcast that helps you remember some things that you forgot along the way, as well as helps you remember some things you forgot to know in the first place. I'm Brian. This is a little podcast that we just cracked the 1.5 million listens mark. Thanks to people like you who tune into this. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate you telling your friends and sharing about it on social media. It means a lot. So many of you have said so many nice things. Some of you have said some mean things, and that's okay. It helps balance the yin and yang, the dark side of the force. So if you got something mean to say, don't hold it in. That's what my mother used to always say, (laughs) but she was a Sith Lord. All right. So today on the podcast, I am talking to John Oaks. John is a technician in Utah, really good technician, guy who I've interacted with online, the resident memeologist at HVAC school, but also just a good solid dude. It's one of the admins on the Facebook group. If you haven't joined that yet, you can interact with John there. But today we're talking about VRF and kind of a real world look at what John knows about VRF and what he runs into every day. So here we go. John Oaks talking VRF. Okay, so just to set the scene here, there's some podcasts that I do where I'm at my office studio and they're set up with uh, luminaries of the HVAC industry. And then there's some that I do because I'm trying to fight a technician into coming on. And I don't know that I've fought with anyone longer than you to try to get (laughs) you on the podcast. I literally have guests in my house. Do you know Corbett Lunsford by any chance? Have you bumped into him online at all? Probably. The name doesn't ring a bell, but I'm sure his profile picture, I recognize him. Better with faces than names. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. He has a tiny house and it's parked in front of my house right now. And I scheduled this with you, knowing that he would be here and knowing that I would have to walk away from visiting with my friend because I did not want to miss out on making sure that I got this done. So the whole point of all of this witty banter, if, if that's what this is, is just to let you know that this is a priority for me and it better be good. <laughs> I've been told that I'm good at putting people at their ease. How's that working for you? Hey, I have some expectations now, so. That's always good whenever it's your first time at something to have a lot of expectations. I learned that on my honeymoon. Works out really well. Today we're talking about VRF. We're talking about variable refrigerant flow systems. Or if you're Daikin, VRV, because you just got to be a little different. Well, they were first, actually. I think everybody else glommed onto the VRF thing after they already set the tone. They were first. They're still different, though, but that's okay. 
you're saying literally Daikin VRV systems are significantly different than other VRF systems, or you're just saying they're the only ones that call it VRV? No, they just copyrighted that name. So they have it, but they invented VRF or VRV back in, I think, 82. It just hasn't really been on this side of the world in our market till just recently, last decade or two. 82 was a good year. 82 was a good year for several things. You born in 82? I was. It's a good year. Lots of good music. Madonna was in her prime at that point in time. You be careful, Brian. You don't want to date yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to date myself no matter what. <laughs> Enough about the VRV history. I have a list of questions here and we're going to work through them. Okay. You ready? Let's go. First off, I want to ask you this question, which is what the heck do you do day in and day out? Because I know you do a lot of VRF, but what does that look like? So I am on the service end of things. Typically with VRF, you're going to have people that install it, which is going to be setting outdoor units, piping, well, for Mitsubishi, it's piping between the indoor unit, which would be the branch controller and the outdoor units, and then running line sets to all the indoor heads. And you're also going to have control guys that are running the daisy chain, setting up central controllers, programming the individual units, doing startup, calculating the total charge for the system. And then once they're done, they all walk away and move on to another job. And then we have this building. Sooner or later, things start to go sideways, and that's when service gets involved and find the leaks, recharge the units, change the filters, wash the coils, and troubleshoot any issues that come along with the systems. And so I'm on that end of things. I'm actually probably really bad at the install end, but as far as troubleshooting these systems are pretty complicated, or they can be, you'd think. That's kind of the part of the industry that I've gotten myself into. All right, so let's do some quick definitions. Well, I'm not going to waste a lot of time explaining what VRF is because you're listening to a podcast that's about VRF, so you must know something about it. But essentially, the way that I like to explain it quickly is just if you've ever seen duckless or mini splits, it's basically like using that type of system, but in a larger commercial environment where you have multiple combinations of air handlers or heads. But you mentioned a couple things that I want to nail down. One of them is a branch box. So for somebody who isn't familiar with what a branch box is, how do you explain that? Each brand is going to do that a little different. Again, my specialty is Mitsubishi. And so basically you have a compressor or compressors running outside, obviously compressors pulling in suction, putting out discharge. And depending on the mode that it's in, whether it's in heating mode or cooling mode or some combination of both, the branch box is going to be taking that and directing it. So units that need heat, it's going to be directing discharge gas to them. It's going to be getting liquid back from those units that need cooling. There's zones that need cooling. It's going to be sending liquid down to them pulling suction gas back. It's got some subcoolers in it. And basically what those are doing is any liquid that's coming from the outdoor unit, it's in cooling mode, sending liquid from outside. It's going to subcool that liquid through these and it's going to just try and maintain the pressures. And it's got a lot of valves in there, a lot of solenoids. It's got several LEVs and it's basically just directing traffic between all the indoor zones. And so in Mitsubishi, the branch box is what allows it to simultaneously heat and cool. And so they actually have a more basic form that doesn't have a branch box or branch controller called Y-Series. Very similar outdoor unit. I and mean, you can, same thing, connect a bunch of indoor units. They just all have to be in the same mode, all in cooling, all in heating, all the ones that are calling anyways. So the branch controller is basically just a lot of copper piping and valves. Yeah. And when you mention that every manufacturer does it differently, this is one area that is done differently depending on the manufacturer. But often in ductless, we're used to having the metering devices being in the outside unit by the compressors, and what we would traditionally call the condensing unit. We're used to having our electronic expansion valves out there, even in multi-zone ductless. In many cases, maybe in all cases, I'm not 100% sure, but in many cases, at least, the metering devices are actually either in the branch box or in the air handler, fan coil, you know, wall-mounted unit itself. And I don't actually know, in Mitsubishi, is the metering device in the branch box or is it still in the air handler? If you were in heating mode, you discharge gas from outside, go through the units, you get liquid back, run it through the subcoolers, get heavily subcooled liquid. There's a metering device in the branch controller. It's going to flash that to saturated suction gas, send that outside, run it through the evaporator outside, then back to the compressor. And again, this is one that every manufacturer does way different because Mitsubishi is a two-pipe system where in some modes, one of their lines is discharge gas and some of their modes, it's going to be a liquid. And so we'll probably talk about that more later. But now in cooling mode, the metering device is just going to be all the indoor heads that are cooling. And so it's just going to take that suction gas and just run it straight to the compressor outside. And in that mode, the outdoor coil is going to be a condenser. In either way, with VRF systems, you're not metering it at the outside unit. You're either metering it, depending on mode, at the branch box or at the head. 
And I think there are some that even in cooling mode will actually do the metering within the branch box. I can't be 100% sure. Again, I've been through training on a lot of these things, but I've only worked on a handful of them. But one thing that I think does differentiate ductless from VRF is that in general, when we say VRF, we're talking about commercial applications and generally three phase. Although I do understand that Mitsubishi has a category of single phase, what they call single phase VRF. And I don't know what the difference is between that and typical ductless. Are you aware? It's interesting the lines between commercial and residential start to blur in this because in theory you could take a commercial unit like the ones you talked about that would run on a lower power supply and if you fed them you could easily run a house on it. I mean they make these condensers that are like a six ton condenser you could run a house on no problem but what I deal with is typically on the commercial end I haven't dealt a lot with the ones that are designed for residential. I know that a lot of the manufacturers have a mini split design with multiple lines which is more like that Y series I talked about. What do they call them like multi splits where you've got like a couple of port connections at the condensing unit or the outdoor unit. We're not going to spend too much time focusing on that. I think there's going to be a much larger majority of techs who will have worked with ductless. And so I'm kind of trying to give them a vision of what this looks like. But the next thing, so there's the branch box. It's sort of in between the air handler, fan coil, head, whatever you want to call it, and the outside unit where the compressors are located, the branch box in between. But then you mentioned daisy chaining controls. And that's something that I think a lot of techs who mostly work on residential aren't going to be familiar with. So what does that mean? On a traditional system, it's going to be driven with a 24-volt kind of signal. A lot of the newer modulating systems have proprietary communicating controls. For most of the VRF, you're more in that direction where they have controllers that will work with them. It's not like 24 volts. It's like 20 volts DC that are like communicating because there's more than just run heat, run cool that's being communicated. There's all the temperatures from all the sensors, the mode that it's in, the fan speed. When it goes into defrost, you've got to send a signal out to up to 50 units to say, hey, change mode, change what you're doing. The whole system is more interconnected. And so the controls are a lot more advanced. Other commercial type systems might have a more basic control, like a lot of rooftops could be run on a residential type thermostat, but then you can have a BMS system that can take over that and run it where a lot of the VRF has like an onboard communication that could be standalone where it could run everything if you just put the thermostats in that the manufacturer has. Yeah, so what I was wanting to kind of nail down is that when we think about in the more residential world, even when we're thinking about communicated controls, we're more thinking one-to-one-to-one, air handler, condenser, thermostat, or controller. In this case, you're taking multiple components and you're taking control, comm wire, and you're just basically connecting them all together, and then you're programming it at the controller with the different, whatever the addresses are for the different years, essentially addressing all the different units and programming. And in essence, in most cases, you're really literally just looping a comm wire and interconnecting everything, essentially. I mean, and not everything, everything, but a lot of different components are being connected in together. And then you're essentially sorting them out when you address them in the control. At least that's my way of understanding it. Tell me if I'm wrong there. Yeah. So every unit, the outdoor units, the branch controller, all the indoor units will have an address and they've got rules of this address has to be in sequence with these addresses and this type of unit goes in this address range and they've got rules like that, but they're all daisy chained together. They're all fully communicating. And if they lost a unit that they know they're supposed to be saying, they'll other units will report that error. Hey, we, communication error. Like if the outdoor unit has an issue that throws a hard error code and shuts down all the indoor thermostats will start flashing that error code. It's all very interconnected, which is both helpful and not helpful as well. Remember there was one that had a condensate issue. And because the condensate lines can be tied together, it said, well, I don't know if I'm flooding the building, so shut the whole floor down just because it had a pump that was disconnected. So it can be a benefit as well as a bane. But more and more as time goes on, I'm seeing systems where you have a commercial system, a Metasys or an Allerton or a Stafa kind of system that is going to be pulling data points from the indoor units through that communication protocol and also can be writing to those points where they say, okay, put this one in occupied K, put this one to heat, K, change this one set point. So when I started working on these, I didn't see that as much and I'm seeing it more and more as time goes on, which again can be good and bad. We had one the other day where the schedule was set up wrong. And so it took Thanksgiving a day early (laughs) and then the whole building was unoccupied and nothing was at temperature. Right. I mean, that's the same with any type of control strategy that we use. The more complicated you get, the more you're trying to do fancy setbacks or trying to make adjustments based on preemptively, you're going to run into more potential for error. And so you just have to be that much more diligent to make sure that it's all set up properly. makes sense that those sorts of mistakes will happen if you're not super diligent on the setup. 
it's more than just making sure everything's running in the right mode. So like the outdoor unit kind of will flip through the different modes, heating only, cooling only, heating main, cooling main, depending on what the indoor units are calling. And so to coordinate that, what should the valves be doing? What should the compressor be doing? Does it need to ramp up? Does it need to ramp down? Does it have enough cooling units shut down that we need to switch to a heating main mode? To coordinate that is a lot of information that needs to be collected and gathered. And I don't know how you would do it with anything but a fully communicating system. We talk about this coming out in 82. I imagine the systems we have now are a lot more advanced than they were in 82. The manufacturers, as time goes on, we're seeing as more and more technologies become more mainstream, I just see these keep getting better and better. What they can do compared to, I've run into a couple of buildings that had systems from 10, 15 years ago, and I'm floored with how much more sophisticated the new ones are coming out now in just even that short amount of time. This industry is not like, okay, this is it. This is the product. This is VRF. They are constantly improving, upgrading. They're just getting better and better. And a lot of people, you start to see the advantages of this type of system, give it 20 years. I'd say probably one in four buildings is going to be BRF, some brand, some variety of it. I mean, now is a really good time to start learning about these. Companies should probably already be bidding on these if they're a commercial contractor. But getting your mind open to the possibility of working on these and upping your game to understand, okay, so it's a heat pump. Well, what's a heat pump? Okay, what well, runs on an inverter? Okay, what's an inverter? How does that operate? Okay, it's got these controls. There's a lot of components that need to be understood. Like you can take a basic understanding. Well, I understand the four components of the refrigeration cycle. Okay, well, we take that and we twist it like a pretzel. These actually run like a high pressure zone, but they also have a mid pressure zone. And they're going to have your basic components, but it's we've got systems where in the right mode, if you've got units that are heating and some that are cooling, I mean, you might not have refrigerant going through the outdoor coil at all all the heat transfer maybe from this zone here to that zone there, and then the suction gas go back to the compressor. Very different from what you would see in a standard commercial rooftop, a standard commercial condenser, residential systems. I mean, even some of the more advanced systems like some of the geothermal systems. I mean, the complexity of these is starting to approach for the comfort cooling end. You're starting to see more components that are like you'd see in a rack grocery store, but it's a good time to be learning about these and to be getting out there it really is a wonderful opportunity to expand yourself as a technician and give yourself a place in the industry in the next 20 years. You pulled a Jim Bergman on me just there. What, saying in the next 20 years? Do you know what a Jim Bergman is? What's a Jim Berger? <laughs> Not Jim Berger, Jim Bergman. You know who Jim Bergman is, right? Is like a cheese? No, it's Lindberger. <laughs> <laughs> I know who Jim Bergman is. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, a Jim Bergman is when you start off on a technical subject and then you end up spinning into like this really in-depth, like positive industry-wide motivational speech. So that was good. I'm very motivated. I want to go work on a VRF system right this second. I want to go find one right now and go work on it. Do they have capacitors? Because I know how to change capacitors. I'm really good at that. So like the inverter boards, I tried to count up how much capacitance was on one of those. It was like 25,000 microfarads between all the capacitors on the inverter board. Whoa, that's way too many microfarads. And they're all like soldered to the board. Wow, that's a lot of them. Some of the indoor units, some of the indoor blowers are run on inverter boards. No more PSC motors, which is actually kind of trippy because you can't even tell when they're running. What do you mean you can't tell when they're running? Just because they run so slow? I've been sitting there waiting for one to kick on. And then I'm like, is it even running? And then I reach up my hand and I can feel just a little bit of airflow coming out. I'm like, hey, it kicked on. When, how long has it been going on? Where, you know, when a PSC motor kicks on, you can hear it down the hall. Yeah, well, I mean, that's sort of like ECM motors that we've worked on in residential for a while. I mean, that's basically what an ECM motor is. It's just a inverter drive or a VFD coupled to a three-phase motor, basically. Right. Anyway, I digress. Next question that I want to ask you is one of the first things, whenever you have a new technology, and we've seen this a lot with flare fittings. That's one thing that we saw in Dockless, and I'm sure that's carried over to VRF, is just if people didn't know how to make proper flares... That became a nightmare for those of us going back later, trying to deal with, especially these systems that have total charges, is significant. And when you have a VRF system, you've got a lot of refrigerant that's shared across many different heads and leaks can cause a real problem. So what are some of the most common installation errors that you've run into and you've had to correct as you've done more and more of this? Well, charge on these is pretty critical because it's not as simple as, well, and block the outdoor coil, kick it on and check your subcooling. If there's a charge issue... The problem that these systems have is they're too smart. Like if it's low on charge, it just slows the compressor down and the pressures look normal. 
It just, it's moving less refrigerant, but the suction pressure comes up and the head pressure comes down and it can mask those problems really well. So how do you deal with it? Like you're not weighing out total system charges. If you have a system that's got a leak in it or a little bit short on charge, how do you deal with that? So each manufacturer is a little different. I know Daikin has like a charge mode where it will tell you add gas, take gas out, and it will take the guesswork out of it, which would be nice. I wish Mitsubishi had that. For Mitsubishi, they've got a couple options. Obviously, the most accurate is they have what's called the Diamond System Builder, where you punch in. You're like, I've got these outdoor units. I've got a branch controller. I've got these indoor units that are these models. I've got this many feet of line set. It's this size. And you punch in all the information. It says, okay, your total charge for the system is 162 pounds. You need to add 112 pounds or whatever. And it's there. And it creates a record. It's permanent. You save the file. And if you ever have a question down the road, I mean, you'd hope it'd be written on the unit, but even if it's not, those get filed with Mitsubishi, you can hunt it down and say, okay, here's my charge. So if there were ever a question or if the system were empty, you know, had a massive leak or you needed to change compressors and you had to pull it all out, you can compare that and weigh that amount in. Now, that's impractical if it's in the middle of the summer, you just want to check. And so they've got a mode called refrigerant adjust mode. You kick it in the mode, put everything in test cooling mode. It stops modulating as much. It goes into a more stable mode. Compressor frequency kind of doesn't fluctuate as much. The indoor metering devices stop opening and closing so much. They don't hunt as much. And then once it's all stabilized, you just look and you say, okay, my compressor discharge should be above this, below this. My subcooling in the branch controller here should be above this, below this. And here should be above this. And if everything checks, the systems roughly charge correctly. The really hard time to charge them is the middle of the winter because you can't do most of those. And so you can always charge it till the numbers look decent, but you usually want to go back and charge it when you have better conditions, either pull the whole charge or go through the refrigerant adjust mode. Getting the correct amount of charge in there is critical. Like I've run into some systems where I don't know exactly what happened. I think people rounded up on line set lengths. They used a 75 foot line set, but they cut off 15 feet, but they listed it as 75. So they listed too much line set, told them too much charge. They charge it to that amount, and then that's too much. And so with anything, if you put garbage into the calculator, you're going to get garbage out. So the people that are installing these, there's a great deal of care that needs to be taken while you're installing them, planning that goes into it, accurate notes, accurate red lines. It doesn't react well to being installed poorly. We'll put it that way. I mean, if there are leaks and you lose charge, again, you run into the issue of charging it correctly after that. Have you run into a lot of challenges with leaks after installs? So for a time, Mitsubishi was using flares, and I personally like flares. I know there's some people that love them, some people that hate them. I like them if they're done right, but I've had to fix a lot of flares that were leaking. You go, you look at the branch controller because you got 32 flares up there. You can look, spot the oil, pull the line down, redo the flare. Done that a lot. I've probably fixed 50, 60 flares at this point. Anymore, they're, all the new systems coming out are the majority of the connections are brazed now. But the double-edged sword with that is it's not as easy to create a braze joint that's going to leak. But if, for example, if you don't flow nitrogen while you braze, these systems are different from any system I worked on because, I mean, there's screens throughout the system, little wire mesh screens inside the different points, but there's no filter dryers. Like that stuff just just going to keep circulating around until it finds something to plug up, whether it's an oil pickup screen or a screen out to an LEV or something like that. And so, again, they don't respond well to being poorly installed. It might not be in the first day, week, month, but you give it long enough and you'll plug something up, you'll lose oil return, and then you'll be changing compressors. Yeah, the other side is is that with braze connections, and I'm a fan of braze connections, but the challenge in commercial is now you're going to have so many braze connections. And if you have a leak on one and you go back later, well, now you've got to bring your torches into a commercial building, and that can cause a lot of heartache bringing torches in and making a fire inside of a commercial building. And there's a lot of restrictions that are involved there that aren't fun to deal with. So as much as I prefer brazing, I do kind of wish that we would just get better at making flared connections because it does eliminate some of those problems. Well, and the majority of the repairs I make, I mean, other than maybe adjusting charge and tightening a flare, which is rare anymore because a lot of the connections are brazed. And the vast majority of repairs I make on one of these is going to be in the refrigerant circuit somewhere, and it's going to be brazing. And so if this is something you want to get into, I mean, your brazing skills need to be spot on because there's a lot of sensitive components that they have in here. I mean, they've got transducers, they've got LEVs, they've got solenoid valves, they've got everything from inch and five eight lines all the way down to like eighth inch line capillary tubes. I've had up my game when it comes to brazing with this, but it's good. It's something that I feel 
someone could very easily specialize in and get very good at over time. But how do you? Well, that's what you've done, right? Well, I'm working on it. Every time I think I've got this stuff figured out, something else comes out and you got something that kicks your butt and you got to up your game again. So at one point I would have said, yeah, I'm great at this. Now I'm just like, I'm doing okay. (laughs) I'm doing okay. And I think that's something that's kept a lot of people away from it is when you start looking at it. I mean, there's a learning curve. There's a steep learning curve right up front. Even just to look at the system, to pull those data points, because like I was talking about earlier, the control system can pull those data points from all the indoor units, from all the outdoor sensors, figure out what it's going to do, command valves. You can pull all that, but you need a laptop to do it. And you need to have a special software and a special interface tool. And even if you have all that, for Mitsubishi, at least, it's just a wall of data coming at you. I know some of the other brands have more user-friendly interfaces where it's got a compressor and it shows that it's running and it takes the data points and overlays them for different spots. For Mitsubishi, it's just a bunch of data. It's like, okay, thermistor 14 has this temperature and you just kind of need to know where everything's at. And so it's taken some time to get comfortable with just looking at a wall of data and looking at trends, trying to figure out why it's doing what it's doing and what may be wrong with it. All right, I want to take a quick pause here and thank one of our sponsors and talk a little bit about their product. And that is Fieldpiece, and the product is the MR45 recovering machine. I've used a lot of recovery machines over the years. I know that they can be a giant pain in the butt, but the MR45 just makes it so easy. In fact, that was a complaint that one of my installers had is he said, I don't know how I feel about this tool. I'm like, really? What don't you like about it? He's like, it, it makes it so easy that when I train a guy using the MR45 and he goes and tries to use a different recovery machine, he doesn't know what to do. So I guess that is a risky run, is that once you use the MR45, you're not going to know how to use anything else because the things are so intuitive, but it's got a nice digital display on it. You don't even have to use gauges. You can just hook it straight up with a hose because it's got the valves on it, and then it's also got a pressure gauge on the recovery machine, making it very easy. In addition to the digital display, it also has a DC motor in it. It's very quiet. It's very light. There's a lot of really good traits. You can actually find a video that I did with my technician, Bert, at True Tech Tools, YouTube channel on the MR45, and you can also buy the MR45 at trusted supply houses all around the country, or if you can't find one, go to truetechtools.com, look up the MR45, and use the offer code GETSCHOOLED for a great discount. All right, here we go. Back to John. What were you going to ask me before you were like, how do you, and then you stopped? I was going to ask you, because there's a third option with between flares and brazes, and that would be with, I don't know, Zoom Lock. I know some people absolutely love it. It's the best thing ever. And other people, eh, no, well, maybe later or never. I was just curious how you feel about that. I think it's something that I think it's coming. I tend not to be an early adopter on things that have really high risk. I think there's certain applications that it's worth looking into. I mean, as you and others know, ZoomLock was once a sponsor of the podcast, and I am not opposed to it. I think it's a good technology. I think they did a good job with it. But the challenge is, is that there's been mistakes made. And so there's some very large retailers, of which I will not name, who are customers of ours, who strictly ban it because there's been issues. And I think the issues are largely due to installation practices. I don't doubt that. But like anything, if you're going to do something that's very high risk, you got to get it right. And I think manufacturers who bring products to market need to be more hands on to make sure that it is right when the risk is high. And so I think it's coming. I think the day will come where the majority of the connections that are made in the industry will be flame free. There's reasons why you don't want to pull a flame out all the time. There will always be the need to use a flame. They're doing repairs and things. You're going to need to know how to braze. That's necessary. But I do see a future at some point where we're going to make connections that are fairly easy to make using specialized tools that aren't going to involve either making flares or having to pull out your torches in order to make initial installed connections. But again, it still comes down to how you actually apply it. Do you do it the way that it's supposed to be done? Otherwise, it's going to leak. That's just always going to be the case. So what are your thoughts? I think that'd be great. As much as I enjoy brazing, I pet brazing. You can get burned. You can cause issues with the piping. You're sitting there catching an insulation on fire. You're like, I don't enjoy this. <laughs> so, no, I, that would be fun. That would be nice to have that come down the pipe. But with all those that we just talked about, flares and brazing and zoom lock mechanical fittings like that, if they're installed improperly, any of them, there's problems that they create. So whatever you're doing, make sure you're doing it correctly. Make sure you have a tight, dry system. Because here's the thing, we talk about the problems, but I have systems that they were installed properly, the charge is correct, and all the joints were put in correctly. And other than looking at it and washing the outdoor coils and changing filters, I have had zero repairs on them going on like five, six, seven, eight years. I'm sure something will break sooner or later, but you just kind of look at it, you're like, yeah, it's just doing its thing. No issues. It's just doing everything it's supposed to. 
It's held temperature constantly. Zero issues. When things are installed like that, yeah, I mean, you'd wish every system, every building was installed that way. I mean, if every system got installed that way, I don't have a job, but. <laughs> and that goes back to the old, like, even if all else fails, we have a job because we're the janitors who have to take this stuff apart and clean it every once in a while. So we're always going to have a job. Well, there's no capacitors to change, Brian. So. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> that is true. I, that's all I ever do is I just I open up an air conditioner and I just look for the failed capacitor. And if it doesn't have one of those, then I just put it back together and I tell them they need a new one. <laughs> it's worked well for me so far. That's how I built my podcast empire. On capacitors. Yes, yes, literally on capacitors built on a giant pile of failed bloated capacitors. Okay, next question that I have for you is condensation because condensate removal is something that scares me to death with VRF. (laughs) You're still laughing. You haven't gotten over the capacitor thing yet. Well, I just find I feel like a meme is going to come out of this. Would you like a meme out of this? I would actually. You do the thing. Here's the other thing that you do because you're a very polite person. You do the same thing that Andrew Reeves does when he's on the podcast, which is that as soon as I start talking, he just stops talking. And you do that same thing. And you've got to learn that in order for this to be good, you've got to talk over me. That's the definition of a good podcast. When you just get trampled as a host. <laughs> right. All of my most popular podcasts are with Jim Bergman and he it just eviscerates me the entire time. And it's great. So I will keep that in mind. Just a quick reminder. I'll there. start thinking about a meme for this situation. <laughs> Brian on the top of a giant pile of capacitors, (laughs) just like with a flag in it, just be like, Carlos. (laughs) (laughs) There's actually way more truth in that than I'm willing to admit. Next question, condensation, because condensate is the thing, at least in Florida, that terrifies me about ductless, about VRF, all of it, is that now you have all of these separate heads that are usually in, at least in the ones I've worked on, in fairly inconvenient places if they were to start leaking. I remember one of the first ductless systems we installed in a commercial location, we put in a office in a grocery store. And then like six months later, it was actually leaking onto their security computer that they placed right underneath this head and nobody was happy. So I've had a lot of terrified moments in my career since then. So talk to me about condensate, condensate removal. Do you have issues with that? What do you run into? So a lot of the units can be drained or can run your condensate two different ways. Under all the coils, you're going to have obviously condensate pans. And at one end, the lower end, it's going to have a connection. You can run a gravity drain and just drain it away like you would anything else. And you know, the rules that apply, you can easily put a clean out, blow it out with nitrogen, do whatever you're going to do. A lot of the ducted units, so they make moderately high static duct, 0.5 inches, 0.2, 0.6 ducted units. They will have a pump in them. And so you just cap the gravity drain when the pump float sees that there's condensate or however it's detecting condensate kicks on. It actually usually has a connection at the top of the unit. Then you're supposed to go over like a little hump and then it gravity drains from there. And to be honest, I have had a grand total of zero calls that were related to a backup in the condensate system. Now, in Florida, they probably would create a lot more condensate than they do here. And it would be a larger part of, I'm in Utah. Utah is very dry. And so in Florida or other humid places, I imagine it would be a more regular type of service call. But at that point, they've got a pump. You can easily pull the pan, look at the pump, replace the pump. The units that don't have onboard pumps, you can easily add a aftermarket pump. There's a whole different variety of them that are designed for mini splits and things like that. So in that regard, I don't know if you'd have issues in Florida with that. I know here in Utah where it's still relatively dry. The only time I've had issues is there was one where the pump was unplugged for some reason and the resolution was plugging the pump and then it cleared the air and started back up. And the other was it was thinking there was condensate when there wasn't because it was detecting the condensate in a really weird way. It had a thermistor in the pan. And so it was getting wafts of cold air and it thought there was condensate and it couldn't get rid of it and it tripped out. But actual condensate, it's not been an issue. Now watch, because of that... I'm going to have one like in a week and I'm going to be cursing you because I'm going to have to like cut open these copper lines and blow them out with nitrogen. Now, what kind of cursing will you be doing? Is it going to be like modern profanity or is it going to be like old school 17th century cursing? Like may the fleas of a thousand camels. Well, you need to understand that here in Utah, cursing is not cursing in other parts of the country. Cursing here would consist of like a mean look and like a strongly worded letter, something like that. Like consternations of you. (laughs) A strongly worded email that said something like sincerely at the end instead of God bless. Well, it's 2018, so it'd be a meme, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Okay. If that happened, there's going to be a meme. 
It'll be everywhere. Yeah. So those of you who don't know John, I've <laughs> dubbed him the resident memeologist of HVAC school. So anytime there is something that's meme worthy, John makes one. Recently, I was actually shown as Vladimir Putin in one of his memes, <laughs> which I think was intended to be positive, but I don't know. That was interesting. If you go to Russia, Vladimir Putin is like a hero over there. They show him in like topless photos, like wrestling a wolf. Like that's a very uh, good thing. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No memes of me <laughs> topless wrestling a wolf, please. Okay. Ladies, ladies, calm down. What type of buildings are these that you're working on primarily? Like what is the use of them? Typically, VRF could be installed in a lot of different applications. It's best suited to commercial buildings where you have some interior zone that's going to be heated or cooled year round. Most commercial buildings have a core where they put conference rooms, where they put all the cubicles, where they put server rooms, electrical closets, lights. There's a core of the building that's going to just need cooling almost all the time. So for a VRF system, I mean, usually you'd say, well, we got to have some cooling in there and it's an inefficient thing. For a VRF system in the middle of the winter, I mean, that's your heat source. You're not pulling your heat from outside. Typically, you're pulling that heat and then some from outside, and then heating the building with it. So office spaces, doctor offices, I've seen it a lot in hospitality, where you're going to have apartment buildings, old folks homes. I'm thinking through the different buildings I have. I have one place that was like a, had ballet studios and a spa, yoga studio, stuff like that. Typically, it's going to be commercial buildings. Typically, it's going to be where you have some part of the building that's not touching the exterior. You have small zones that are not necessarily sharing air. So offices or separate areas that are blocked off in some way. Large open spaces like, I don't know, large grocery stores, grocery stores, banquet halls, warehouses. Those are better served by different types of systems. Not that I'm sure someone hasn't tried, but so usually it's some mid range commercial atmosphere. Yeah. So it's a little bit of fragmentation usually within the spaces. And so you name the applications that I think are best suited, maybe even on the residential side, maybe multifamily condo type applications in some cases, hospitality, medical, office space, anything that you have a reasonable amount of diversity to. As the diversity goes up between the zones, the efficiency of the system increases. And as the efficiency increases, the compressors actually work less hard and it's less wear and tear on the systems. Whenever they're in full-blown heating or full-blown cooling, that's the hardest they work. But in the shoulder seasons, when it's part load, some heating, some cooling, north end of the building is heating, south end of the building is cooling, it's got all the windows, solar load. That's when these things just shine, which is ironic because other systems that are sized for the absolute hottest or coldest part of the year, that's when they struggle because they short cycle and they're way oversized. VRF systems really do well in that environment. So it's interesting. So yes, diversity, that was something that I learned early on when I went to VRF training with Mitsubishi. And that's just the idea that you have different, generally speaking, you're going to have heating call in one zone, cooling call in another zone. And you especially see this in commercial buildings where you may have a call for heating in some of the central zones and then maybe even cooling on the external zones or vice versa, depending on the load conditions. And then, like you mentioned, you'll have uh, diversity that will occur because of the sun going across the horizon, et cetera, et cetera. And that is where these systems work really well. And I wanted you to address this quickly, this whole two pipe versus three pipe thing. You addressed that a little bit at the beginning of the podcast, but I think most of us have no clue how that works. How could you possibly run something that is operating in both heating and cooling on the same system with only two pipes going inside the building. That doesn't make any sense. The system I specialize in is Mitsubishi City Multi. It's a two-pipe system, meaning there's two pipes between the branch controller or the branch box and the outdoor unit. Most other systems are three-pipe. And the three pipes would be, one is for discharge gas, which is high pressure, high temperature. One is for suction gas, which is low pressure, low temperature. And one is for liquid. And depending on what mode they're in, each indoor unit is going to be tapping into two of those. And some of them will have those piped directly to the unit. Some of them will have them piped to smaller branch boxes in Mitsubishi City Multi. So the two easiest, I guess you could say, would be just straight cooling, which is going to be doing the same thing. I mean, let's say you have 10 units and eight of them want cooling and the other two are off. It's just going to hot gas from the compressors. The discharge gas is going to go through the outdoor unit, be condensed, liquid into the branch controller, picks up extra subcooling out to the units. It does its thing, meters at the metering devices, the LEVs, picks up its superheat, and then it's sent straight back to the compressor, just like a normal air conditioner. Same cycle. Heating, same thing, would run like a normal heat pump in heat mode, 
hot gas from the compressor sent inside on one of the lines through the indoor units, desuperheated, phase changed, picked to a liquid, picks up subcooling, and then goes to that metering device in the branch controller we were talking about. It's going to be turned into a saturated suction gas, no superheat. Then it's going to go be sent on the other line. So in heat mode, discharge in, suction back out, go outside, run through the outdoor coil, picks up its superheat, and then goes to the compressor. So those are the two simple ones. The two more complicated ones would be when you have mostly heating with a little cooling and mostly cooling with little heating. So for mostly heating with a little cooling, it's the same basic mode, but instead of all of the liquid coming off of the heating units, going to that metering device and being sent back out, some of it is then going to be directed to the units that are cooling and then their metering devices flash it to a suction gas, pick up the superheat. And then it's just going to mix that superheated suction gas with the saturated suction gas, then go to the outdoor coil. So basically what you're saying is that you could have some of your indoor heads functioning as condensers and some of them functioning as evaporators. And rather than having that refrigerant moving all the way back to the condenser, instead you're just re-diverting it. And I imagine there's a cornucopia, that's the word that comes to mind, a cornucopia of valves that make this happen. I was thinking menagerie or assortment, but cornucopia works as well. All right, we're going to stick with cornucopia. A cornucopia of valves that would have to be present in order to make that happen, so that way you can redirect that flow as necessary. But it makes sense that that would work, and it would make sense that it would happen whether or not you have primarily cooling or primarily heating. You're just taking a portion of it, and instead of sending it back to the condenser, you're sending it back to a a head that needs to operate. So as an example, I'm just imagining, okay, you have one head that's operating as an evaporator coil, And so you have uh, liquid coming in, it's flashing off, going into the evaporator, coming back. Well, actually, no, that is a little more challenging. Okay, now all of a sudden I've run into a problem. I can imagine it easier the other way where you have it operating as a condenser. So it's operating as heating. It goes through, it condenses, changes to a liquid, and then you just take that liquid and move it into another evaporator, flash it off there, saturated liquid. But I'm having a harder time imagining. So if it goes in, how are you going to heat it? Because it has to go through the compressor and be compressed for it to come out as a hot discharge gas. Okay, I'm missing this part. Here's the tricky part. So in the mode where it's mostly cooling with a little heating, we need it to basically run like a regular air conditioner where we'd send in liquid and bring back suction to the outdoor unit. However, we can't just send liquid to the indoor units that need heat that it's not going to heat very well. And that's usually where the third pipe would come in, get where you'd have a separate line for discharge and liquid. In the two pipe system, they actually have It's like a chamber in the branch controller. It connects to the high pressure line. Which in this case is a liquid line. Liquid line in some modes, discharge line in some modes. So one of the two lines in the two pipe is dedicated suction. It's either saturated or superheated suction gas all the time. The other line, I'm just going to call it a high pressure line because depending on the mode, it's either liquid in or discharge gas in. And when you say mode, it's like the majority mode. So the system has to decide... It has to know, are we majority cooling or are we majority heating? Yeah. So it looks at the indoor units and says, what's calling? Well, it's all cooling, all heating. It can make a decision. But if it's a mixture, it'll pick either mostly heating with a little cooling or mostly cooling with a little heating. And that changes what valves are open, how it's going to run. And the tricky one that you'd get hung up on on the two pipe is when you're mostly cooling with a little heating. And what they do is in the outdoor unit, they condense the discharge gas mostly, but they don't subcool it. So it's saturated. And down the high pressure line, they're going to send a saturated liquid gas mixture. And in this chamber, the hot gas in that mixture is going to go out the top. And this is just by gravity. And the liquid is going to go out the bottom. And the hot gas that comes off the top is going to be sent out to the units that are heating. And it's not very much heat. I mean, it's not like discharge gas, but if everything needs cooling except for one little thing, it probably doesn't need much heat anyways. And then the cooling is going to go to the liquid header. And it's going to go out to all the units that are cooling. Then for that one unit that's heating, it pulls the heat out, subcools it, or phase change, subcools. And then that liquid just joins, goes back to the liquid header again. And so that chamber where it splits the phases, that's kind of what Mitsubishi has that lets them do two pipes. And I'm sure other manufacturers could use that, but eh, why Why do what Mitsubishi is doing? Or they're going to do what they're going to do. It's very interesting to see a technology develop between the different manufacturers, how they're all trying to accomplish the same thing, but they're doing it all different ways. That reminds me a lot of in commercial refrigeration, they have cool gas defrost instead of hot gas defrost. And it's essentially the same thing. You're taking vapor 
off the top of a receiver and you're using that for defrost instead of using hot gas straight off the compressor. And so it sounds like a very similar type of thing here where it's almost acting like that chamber is almost sort of like a receiver. It's not for that purpose, obviously, but yeah, that makes sense. I get it. In cooling mode, you're going to get liquid in and it's just all going to go straight off the bottom into the liquid header. In heating mode, it's all going to be gas, a discharge gas, and it's all going to go out the top. But in that one mode, it'll go and it'll split and it'll actually separate in there. So it's pretty neat. And I've never really had one fail or have issues. It just kind of sits there and does its thing because it's not really any moving components in it. But it's been interesting to read up on the literature and understand what's happening in there, why it's significant and what makes it a little different from the other manufacturers. Anyways, what they're doing with the refrigeration circuit, again, it's the same four components, your compressor, your condenser, your metering device, your evaporator. But the way that they take it and the way that they twist it and the way that they move the refrigerant around to accomplish what they do is just, it's so different than what I learned when I was going through basic HVAC trade school. Knowing the basics, understanding, well, what happens to my pressures when I add heat? What happens to my pressures when I close a valve, when I open a valve, when I have a restriction? Because they intentionally have restrictions sometimes to accomplish various things. Understanding those basics, not just like, yeah, I, I can spot that if I had a system, but really getting to the point where you can just look at the pressures and temperatures and know what's happening in the system. It's beneficial because like I said, it's a wall of data and you've got four pressure transducers or six pressure transducers and they're all just spitting out pressures simultaneously and you got temperatures and your calculated subcool superheat values and it's just a lot going on there. So now I'm going to let you wrap up. I'll give you a couple of suggestions of things you could do. You could do a little montage of VRF related motivational talks. Hmm. You could just give an, a general inspirational speech or quote. You could talk about some other th question that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you about VRF, whatever you so choose. But this is your closing statement. VRF is good stuff. And the HVC school group is a wonderful vehicle for education. I'm happy to be on the podcast and if you've thought about VRF and you don't think it's for you, think again, because whether we like it or not, it's something I think more and more of us will be experiencing in all levels of the industry from residential to commercial. So it's a good time to begin learning about it and honing our skills. And there's my quote. There you have it. Everybody, Jonathan Oaks, insert <laughs> um, clapping right here. I oh, mean, I don't have a clapping sound effect that I can add straight in here. This is, I mean, I've got this. Oh, that's not. No, that's terrible. That is terrible. No, that's not. That, is, that isn't. I've got this. No, that's not. <laughs> Sorry, I've got nothing for you here. I'll have to add it in post-production. You have had sound effects this whole time, and you are just now bringing them out? <laughs> I do. I do. I have a whole bunch of... Yeah, I've got... I've got this. What do you think about that? I think that that is what you... You play that right before you ask a question. That would be much better. Oh, okay. All right. Well, hey, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. We're going to talk more about VRF in the future. I've actually got, I don't know if you know Jordan Cummings. He's a Daikin guy. Yes. We're going to have a Dad Burn series of VRF podcasts coming up. We've got Jordan Cummings coming on the podcast. He's going to talk about VRF design, which is something I know nothing about. And that's what he does day in and day out. And hey, maybe you'll even learn something, John. Yeah. Well, the design end is... I mean, I doubt it. I can appreciate a good design, but if you were asking me to design one, it would be terrible. You would use Mitsubishi Diamond Builder, right? Isn't that what it's called? VRF is a team effort. And I am a part of that team, but I am not the whole team. That's why there's no I in VRF. Well, if you spelled the whole thing out, there's an I in variable and there's at least one I. Ah, you make a good point. And I guess the I is me. Mm -hmm, the eye of the tiger. Well, the eye of the refrigerant. All right, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. Brian, it has been a pleasure. Yeah, always, always. And we're going to do it again sometime soon. Do you have any dad jokes that you'd like to end with for us here? Do you have anything that's just burning a hole in your bonnet? Well, whenever someone is trying to rush me, I just tell them they'd be a terrible doctor because they got no patience. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You have kids, right? Yes, I have four kids. Okay. I don't even think your kids would laugh at that. I love most of them, but the ones that laugh at my jokes are definitely <laughs> on that list. The ones that you love or the ones you don't love? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if any of them like my jokes, honestly. So, yeah, my kids never laugh at my jokes ever. Never. You get some pretty good reception in the group, though. But with my jokes? Sometimes when they're funny. Yeah. I think I've seen a funny one. I don't get any comments on my dad jokes that I end up the podcast with anymore. I think everybody just shuts off. At this point in the podcast, we could literally talk about anything we wanted. 
<laughs> and nobody listens because it's post dad joke. Post dad joke. I'm like, and I'm done. Yeah, I'm out. All right. Hey, John, thanks. Brian, this was fun. We'll have to do this again. All right, let's do it. All right, thanks to John for coming on the podcast. And thank you to all of you who work hard every day and continue to make the trade great again. And yeah, appreciate you for listening to the podcast and improving yourself, telling others about it. Like I mentioned before, if you haven't downloaded the app, there's some good things in the app. I think you'll like it. The one thing some people have to get used to, there's a lot of swiping left and right. So when you open up the app, swipe left and right in order to get to different menus. But that is HVAC School. You can find that in the Google Play Store or in the, I don't know what you call it, Apple App Store, I guess, on your phone or on your tablet. It should work on either. The capacitor under load test that we have in there, calculator is very popular as well as the nitrogen pressure test app. There's a couple things in there that you're going to like. Hopefully, well, if you don't like it, let me know. I'm happy to hear your feedback on that as well. But I uh, sure appreciate you downloading it and maybe giving me a review on the app too. That'd be cool, right? Say what you need to say, as John Mayer said. Anyway, the other day I went with my wife. We were at a hotel and we were done at the hotel. So I went up to the counter to let the lady at the counter know that I was leaving. And I came back and my wife kind of had a weird look on her face. And she said, that hotel receptionist was totally checking you out. <laughs> Get it? To checking, you know, because it's called check. Okay. Anyway, all right. Thanks for listening to <laughs> HVC School Podcast. I guess we'll talk to you next time. No, that's not how I end the podcast. And we'll talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. Thanks for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.